John chapter 14. John chapter 14. Let's go ahead and start reading in verse 1. It says, Let not your heart be troubled. You, you believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. And whither I go ye know, and the way ye know. Thomas saith unto him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. If ye had known me, ye should have known my Father also, and from henceforth ye know him, and have seen him. Philip saith unto him, Lord, show us the Father, and it sufficeth us. Jesus saith unto him, Have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that has seen me has seen the Father. And how sayest thou then, Show us the Father? Believest thou not that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father in me, or else believe me for the very work's sake. I'm going to stop reading right there. Now, this passage of Scripture here, uh, we were talking a little bit about this before church, but this is the book of John is one of the main books where you see the deity of Christ, where it's very clear. A while back, you know, I did some preaching about the whole Trinity and uh, versus this oneness idea that Jesus is the Father. And right here, when you read this passage here, if you read just this passage, it looks like that Jesus is saying that he is the Father. Therefore, you know, I've made the statement that Jesus is not the Father. That, and, um, and, I, and I still believe that. But what people do, they'll look at this here, and they'll say, no, right there, it's pretty clear that Jesus is the Father. What's going on here? Well, once again, kind of the way I was explaining it before church, Baptists are known for taking one verse, one little statement in the Bible, and just running with it and preaching a message on it. And, and what's so bad about that too, you know, Bapt, I, I listened to a preacher one time, that I, that I forgot the title of his message, what it was exactly, but he was preaching a salvation message. And it was in one of these, you know, trendy hipster churches. And this guy, he's not a trendy hipster preacher, but he's one of these that knows how to morph into whatever group he goes to. And he goes and he reads a verse in the Bible in Genesis where it says, and Jacob went on a journey. And he read that little phrase that says, Jacob went on a journey. And he's like, you know what? Life's a journey. And then he went and preached the plan of salvation message, you know, which was fine. But it was just like, really? You're just, you're just going to take that phrase in the Bible. And, and Baptists are known for that. We'll take a little, uh, we'll take one verse and then just run with it. Or we'll even take a little, not even a verse, a phrase or a word. And then we will preach a whole message on that because it sounds good. But a lot of times we don't ask ourselves, what is the context of that verse? And what's bad with a lot of preachers, once they have preached something, especially if they preach it at a camp meeting or something, or message, you know, they preach it somewhere where a lot of people saw it, that message is now sound doctrine. It is the word of God. It is, you know, if it was written in the sword of the Lord, it is the canon, part of the canon of the Bible. I mean, and they will not back down from that scripture. And there's people have, they've wrote books, you know, that the title of the book was a phrase that you see in the Bible, but then, then they'll take that phrase and then they will run with it. But then you go and you study that, you know, passage of scripture, you look at the context of it. And that phrase actually means something different than what they preached about. And then though these guys get called out and they double down on it and they won't back down. And you do, you got to look at the context. And so, you know, what people need to do, you know, I'm all for studying the Bible close, you know, looking word for word. But then sometimes, you know, just picture you're looking at the, you know, you're looking at the Bible through a microscope. That's fine. But sometimes you got to kind of zoom out a little bit and get the big picture. Look at the words word for word, but then look at the whole verse and then look at the whole chapter. And then look at the whole book of the Bible. And then look at the whole Bible. You know, you got to sometimes step back and take a look at the big picture. And we have been going week by week, okay? We, you know, this is week 14, going through the book of John. And what have we seen 
week after week after week in the book of John. Does anybody kind of know what the theme is of the book of John? It's believe, believe Christ. Believe Him. And the things that Jesus was often saying about Himself, these things were, they were not literal. Jesus is not literally bread. He is not literally a fountain of water. But spiritually, He is all those things, isn't He? And if we will believe Him, if we will believe His words, if we will believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, we have eaten bread from heaven, haven't we? We have eaten Him. Spiritually speaking, we're saved. If you have believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, you have drink, drank the living water and you will live forever. But spiritually speaking, if the Lord Terry's is coming, you're still going to die, aren't you? Okay? These, are, these are spiritual things. And when Jesus, and over and over again, Jesus has been explaining these things, and many people are rejecting him. The Jews are they're they're we want real bread. You know, and so they, they reject him. When they finally found out he was talking about something spiritual, they said, forget it, and they all left him. They got offended. You know, the Pharisees, they would struggle with the parables. Why he's trying to teach something spiritual, and they weren't getting it. And so now here he is with his disciples. You know, this is right at this is uh, right after he did the whole feet washing thing. He's going to be dying. He just told him, "One of you are going to betray me." He told Peter, "You're going to deny me three times." He's telling them bad things are going to come, and then he's t- after that, he's telling them, "Let not your heart be troubled." And he's telling them about how, well, listen, you know, in my father's house are many mansions. I'm going to prepare a place for you, and I'm going to go, and I'm going to come again. That where I am, there may be also. And he said, in the way, he said, you know the way. But, you know, Thomas, kind of the doubter, the skeptic, we don't know the way. He wasn't real sure. Jesus tells him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. You know, and then he says, if ye had known me, ye should have known my Father also. He's speaking spiritually here. The way we get to the Father is through Jesus Christ. Well, I want to see the Father. Well, if you're going to see the Father, you've got to see the Son. You've got to believe the Son. That is, He is not speaking literally here. Those disciples did not literally see God, just like the woman at the well didn't literally drink living water. Okay, but she did believe Him, so she did drink the living water spiritually. And those who believed on Christ, they had seen the Father spiritually speaking. But physically they hadn't. Physically, if we saw the Father, we'd be dead. And so, and you're like, ah, I, I still don't like that. Well, look at what Jesus said in verse eight. Uh, you know, Philip say, or, or Philip saith unto him, Lord, show us the Father, and it sufficeth us. Jesus said unto him, Have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that has seen me has seen the Father also. And how sayest thou then, show us the Father? You know what he's saying here when he's like, I've been all all this time I've been with you, and you still don't get it, Philip. You were there. When I said I am the bread of life, you were, you know you were there when I said you know I'm the water of life. You know he was there. These guys heard him give all these spiritual messages to people. You know that they knew weren't literal but were spiritual. And he's like, and you don't you haven't even got this yet. It's the same thing that Jesus is saying right here when he's telling them, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. He's speaking spiritually here and. When it came to that, the disciples still didn't get it. Philip saying, show us the Father. Basically the same thing that the Jews did when they said, give us bread. It was the same thing. Jesus, at the, uh, you know, he gave them physical bread in the one chapter. I forgot what chapter it was. But in the next chapter, he offered them bread, but it was spiritual bread, wasn't it? It wasn't physical bread. And they didn't want the physical bread or the spiritual bread. They wanted physical bread right here. What Philip was asking for, he was asking for something physical. All right. We've seen you, Jesus. We see you right here in the flesh, but we want to see the father. Was he, is he talking physical or spiritual? He's talking physical. Philip is, but Jesus is like, no, listen, you've been here all this time. You're not getting this yet. Listen, this is a spiritual thing. And today, many people who call themselves Baptists are in the same situation too. That's why they can't understand you know, why Zionism is so bad. They can't understand that, listen, the people of God, 
the Israel of God, the Jews, the chosen people, they are not a physical people. They are a spiritual people. And they can't see that. No, no, it's a physical people. They are the chosen people. Why? Because of their lineage. Even though the Bible spells it out that that's not it, it's like they still haven't seen that yet. They're still looking for a physical people. They're looking for a physical land. They call that wicked land over there, they call it the Holy Land. They go over there. Baptist preachers will go over there. I was there and I saw it happen. I was, I, you know, I was a dumb 19 year old when I went there. Okay. I was not a, I was not a deep theologian, but I remember when I went to the wailing wall and I remember over there seeing, you know, seeing the Jews over, you know, kind of off to the left and they're all doing their bowing thing. And, you know, they do, which was really weird. But then when I saw the guys from our group all going and they're all putting their hands in the wall and just intensely praying, I'm just like, that's weird. Why do we need a wall to pray? You know, that, that's, it was, and I remember I asked him, I thought, you know, I, I remember I asked my dad, I'm like, why are they, why did they do, oh, you know, a lot of people, they like to go there and pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Okay. Uh, you know, and now, now I understand how ridiculous that even that is too. But I mean, okay, if you want to pray for the peace of Jerusalem, you can do that over here. You don't have to go over there and lay your hands on a wall made of stone. Folks, that's just, that's ridiculous. Why are these people like, oh, it's all about that land. You know, we got to help the Jews get that land. Why? It's a, it's a physical land, folks. The land that was promised to Abraham, it was a, it was a heavenly country. And I, I had one of these Ruckmanite pastors I was talking to on the phone one time. And we start talking about the land. And I said, I, I asked him, I said, listen, because he kept saying, you know, God, that was an eternal covenant. It was an eternal covenant with Abraham and his seed. And I told him, I said, listen, that can't be talking about a physical land. He said, absolutely. He's talking about a physical land. I said, no, it can't be talking about a physical land. Do we not believe that this world is going to burn one of these days? I said, if this world is going to burn, would not the land of Israel be included with that? So, He's like, well, you know, but God can remake it. Well, I said, well, yeah, if he wants to, but it wouldn't be the same thing, would it? It's not the same land. That is not an eternal land over there. That land is not going to be here for all eternity. But the, yeah, the promises God made to Abraham were eternal, but they were eternal promises. It was a heavenly country. It was a heavenly Jerusalem. But you know, these people, these dispensationalist people, they can't see it. You know why? Because they're like the Jews. And I hate to say it, but listen, when you're not saved, you're not going to be able to see spiritual things. You're not going to be able to understand spiritual truths. And we ought to understand these things by now. And it's tough sometimes. The disciples had a tough time with it. But Jesus, he's telling Philip, man, I've been with you all this time and you still don't get it. You're still asking me. I'm telling you, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And you're asking, show us the Father, physically speaking. You ought to know better than that by now, Philip. You saw how the people who asked for bread from me that second time walked away with nothing. You knew I was talking about spiritual bread. You understood the living water. You understood all those things, but you don't get this that I'm trying to tell you right now. See, that's the context of that. And when you understand that, you're not going to take John 14 or, and say, nope, that proves that Jesus is the Father. If you've got an agenda and you want to zero in, you want to zoom in on that verse, then... Yeah, that will, that'll preach in a camp meeting. That'll preach in a camp. But listen, that's not what the Bible's trying to teach. Let's zoom out. Let's look at context. Let's look at the big picture. Let's look at what's been going on in the 13 chapters before that. And folks, listen, I hope you've gotten this by now because we've been hitting on this every week. I mean, it's, you know, I, I hate to be repetitive. But listen, if the disciples still hadn't gotten it, you know, maybe... You know, we haven't got either. I think it needs to be repeated because it's repeated throughout the book of John. And so we are, we're, if we're going to, if we're going to be saved, we've got, we've got to believe him. And these promises, the things that he gives us, they are spiritual. When you got saved, what did you receive at that moment? Well, you received the Holy Spirit that you can't see. But you believe it, don't you? You received the gift of eternal life. But what was handed to you physically? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. But you believe that. And if you, be, and if you do believe that, one of these days, you will be in heaven. You will get what was promised to you. 
And while you're here on earth, you might have some doubts every now and then. Satan will tell you, no, it's a lie. It's, it's something else. But listen, those of us who have put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ, who have accepted the free gift of salvation that we receive by faith, that it was not of works. And that's why I worry about these preachers too, that when they tell you about their salvation, all they want to do is tell you about their changed life. Listen, a changed life is something that we can thank God for because His Holy Spirit helped us to change our life. But the changed life is not proof of salvation. What are these people wanting? They want something they can put their finger on. I can't just, you know, they're, they're like the Jews. We want bread. We want actual bread. And, to, and we've asked for salvation of our soul. But what do we want? We want a physical change. I want to see something. I want to have something I can show people. You know, I'll even, you know, can I, can I at least just count the baptism? You know, let's just make baptism a requirement. That way I can, you know, that's something I can see me do physically. I can get it up on video. We can take pictures of it. Everybody will see it. And then I can actually prove I'm saved. But listen, no, the way we prove we're saved is by what the word of God says and by faith in him. So, Yes, when you look at what it says in John chapter 14, those verses we read, it looks like Jesus is the Father, but that was not what he was trying to say. If you are going to see the Father, you're going to have to see Jesus. In other words, you're going to have to believe his words. And I'll show you more of it here in a little bit that makes it very clear that uh, you know, that's not what he, you know, he's trying to teach something spiritual. He's not saying that he's literally the Father. But uh, you know, the things that Jesus tried to get people to believe were things that required faith. Without faith, it's impossible to please him. We're saved by grace through faith. Okay? And, you know, the people, think about this, because the people in Jesus that were in Jesus' day, they had to have, you know, they were required to have faith, weren't they? Got to have faith. Well, if it's just believing in Jesus, okay, that's not enough. You can't just believe that Jesus existed. The Muslims believe that Jesus existed, they believe he's a prophet. The Jews believe Jesus existed, but they hate him. But they believe he existed. So are they saved? No, obviously not. You have to believe that he is God. And so even in their day, okay, it didn't take any faith to believe in Jesus the man. He was right there in front of them. They saw him. So that didn't, that didn't take any faith to believe in Jesus the man, but to believe that he was God, that required faith. To believe that, all right, he's talking right now. He's telling me if I've seen him, I've seen the Father. You know, I expected a little more, you know, seeing God. Moses saw the back parts of God and his face shone. You know, I'm, I'm looking right into his face and nothing's happening here. You know, but once again, if they believe that, it, it, show, you know, it showed they actually did believe him. They believed in his word. And you can't, listen, you have to believe in the deity of Christ. And that's why the Jehovah's Witnesses aren't saved. That's why Mormons aren't saved. That's why Muslims, Jews, they're not saved. They don't, they don't, you have to believe in the deity of, of Christ. You don't get to just believe that Jesus, a man named Jesus existed. And so that, that's an important thing to understand. There's many scriptures that back that up. We're not going to take time to go there. But so, you know, believing in Jesus, the man, it still won't save you today. You must believe that he's God. And so the Jews, they claim to be believers because they talked about God. But it is clear they had no faith. Very clear. They thought they were covered and accepted by God because they were the children of Abraham and kept the law. But listen, they that are in the flesh cannot please God. Flesh and blood shall not inherit the kingdom of God. That's why we don't give a rip about the lineage of any people. Listen, I do not believe... I had a missionary one time. He's not a missionary anymore. He divorced his wife. He had to leave the mission field. But I had a missionary one time that my dad's church tell me that you know we should have separate churches for the whites and the blacks. And I said, Really? And, you know, and he started talking about how, you know, they like to worship one way. They like to clap their hands and get excited, blah, blah, blah. You know, white people don't really like to do it that much. And I'm like, okay, you know, and I'm just like a teenager at the time. You know, I'm not smart enough to give this guy any good argument. I like something's, something's weird with that. But listen, I heard a preacher say this today and I agree with him 100%. The only reason there should be any separation in a church because of ethnicity is if there's a language barrier. 
If people don't speak, you know, if they speak Spanish way better than they speak English, then, you know, they would probably do better in a Spanish speaking church, especially if they can't speak English. Okay. They're not going to get anything from my preaching, but listen, if they can speak our language, they can come, you know, they can come to this church. Even if they can't speak a language, we'll let them sit. Maybe they'll get something. Maybe the Lord will give me the gift of tongues and I'll speak in my language and they'll understand. I doubt that'll happen, but understand, you know, we've all been made of one blood. And this, we have, we have got to get past this whole uh, racial thing. It's hard when you live in America, and that's all the news media wants to talk about. Listen, at work, in the break room, they've got sports on all the time. All that they are talking about anymore with sports is racial stuff. They were talking about the stupid Charlottesville stuff on the sports news. I mean, that was all they were talking about for like a week. They, and all they want to talk about is Kaepernick and black people, and you know, it was just... Drives me nuts. And what's bad is you get, you know, even preachers, they get caught up in the stupidity on stupid racial stuff. And I'm telling you, it's all a bunch of gar, it's a, it's a bunch of garbage. And then they do. And, and I'm telling you, I, I personally believe one of the reasons that Baptists are so quick to jump on this Jew worship stuff, I think it's white guilt. And there is such a thing as white guilt. All right. We have, we have been made to feel guilty for being white by the news media. And so what do we do? We prove we're not racist by worshiping another ethnicity, another race by worshiping Jews. Folks, that's just stupid. How dumb are we? Well, we're pretty dumb. And then unfortunately, there's not a big divide in the stupidity of Americans and Baptists today. And proof of that, September, I think September coming up. And isn't that when they usually do their stupid Israel Sundays in churches all over America? Stupid Israel Sundays. I'm telling you, they're a joke. And you know what? Uh, I don't know. I'm, I'm thinking of, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm done being nice to these people. If you're, that's just, it's, it's so foolish, folks. And so, but they did. They, these Jews, they thought they were covered because of these things. And that, that had nothing to do with it. And so look at verse 12. I was a little too long in that part. But verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me, the works that I do, shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. Now notice who he's saying is going to do the, do the greater works. He's like, you know, he shall do greater works. Talking about us. Talking about them. If I go to my Father, you know, you're, um, the works that I do, he all, uh, he'll do also, and greater works. Verse 13, whatsoever ye shall ask of my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If ye shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. If ye love me, keep my commandments, and I will pray to the Father, and he will give you another comforter, that ye may abide with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him, for he dwelleth with you, and shall be in you. All right, so right here we see Jesus said that we can do greater works than him. Now, how is that possible to do greater works than Jesus Christ? Well, we, we know that it's not us doing the work. It's the Holy Spirit doing the work through us, isn't it? It's the Holy Spirit. doing. He said, I'm going to go and I'm going to send you a comforter. What did the disciples, what did the 120 accomplish in those, in that time period after Jesus ascended to heaven? Till Pentecost. Pretty much nothing. But what happened after Pentecost? They turned the world upside down, didn't they? Why is that? Because of the fact that the Holy Spirit was in them. How big of a following did Jesus have after his three years of ministry? He had 120. How many, how big of a church did they have after just a few weeks of the Holy Spirit dwelling them? They had thousands. I mean, thousands and thousands. They did greater works. The disciples got more people saved after, uh, after Pentecost than Jesus got saved during his ministry. They did greater works than he did. Why? Well, it wasn't because they were great. It's because of the Holy Spirit that was in them. And the Holy Spirit works through us. There's been many people who, uh, you know, have throughout history who have won. I mean, thousands and more than Jesus did in his time. You know, do they get credit for that? No, it was the Holy Spirit through them. The, you know, the Holy Spirit wouldn't have been able to save those people had it not been for Jesus' payment on the cross. Obviously, all glory goes to Him, but that's what He's talking about when He's saying, you'll do greater works than I did because I go to my Father. He still gets the glory for it. 
And then, and, but that's why Paul said, I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. He wasn't bragging about himself. He was giving the glory to Christ. And so, you know, we do these things through him when we keep his commandments. Because notice what he said in there, you know, if ye love me, keep my commandments. That's how we do the great works. That's how we are filled with the Holy Spirit. The way we are filled with the Holy Spirit is when we do, when we keep his commandments, when we do what he would do, when we follow his lead. Okay. The Bible talks about those who are filled talking about the reprobates. They became that way because they were filled with all unrighteousness. If you give your life over to the things of the flesh and just doing whatever your flesh desires, you're going to become a wicked, sorry, pathetic excuse for a human being. But when you're filled with the spirit, you're going to do great things for God. And the way we get filled with the spirit, it's not when you just have this feeling coming over and you're doing like Lana was in the song service and running around the auditorium. Okay. That's not being filled with the Holy ghost. All right. She was filled with the spirit of the devil and she was doing that. But no, listen, that being filled with the Holy spirit is when you are in full obedience to his word, you're doing what Jesus would do. That is when you are filled with the Holy spirit. I heard a preacher saying this the other day too. Every time you see him filled with the spirit in the Bible, you know what they were doing? They weren't running around shouting and singing and doing somersaults. They were soul winning. They were winning people to Christ. You know, that that's what he told them to do. That's what the Holy Spirit wants us to do. This isn't just something where we come together and we just have a great big emotional fun fest. You know, that's not being filled with the Holy Ghost. That's being filled with the flesh, folks. That has nothing to do with the Holy Spirit. That's it's it's a bunch of garbage. And so, uh, but he said, you know, if you love me, keep my commandments and a person, listen, I believe a person can be saved and not love God. Look what it says in first John five, two, first John written by the same John that wrote the book of John. He says, by this, we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments for this is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not grievous. Now, people will try to use these verses sometimes and say, make it if you're saved, you know, you'll keep his commandments. That's not what it says. If you love me, you'll keep my commandments. And if you love him, his commandments are not grievous. You know why some people hate hard preaching? You know why some people it's like, you know, preacher, don't go there. Don't preach that from the Bible because those commandments are grievous to them. You know why they're grievous? Because these people are carnal and they don't love God. They love themselves more than they love God. And so the commandments are grievous. You know, if I love my wife, I'm not going to be grieved by the commandment to remain faithful unto her as long as we both shall live. If I love her, I'm not going to be bothered by that. I'll be fine with that. But if I don't love her, I'm going to have a problem with that. And when we, when we don't love, or when we have a problem with the commands that God has given us, it's because there's something wrong with our relationship. And we, it's because we don't love him like we should. And, you know, uh, look at verse 18 or verse four, uh, verse 14, verse 14. Don't think that verse 14 is a name it and claim. He says, if he shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. Okay. You got these preachers, you know, just whatever he asks, just that, you know, in the name of Jesus, I'm asking for this new truck, you know, in the name of Jesus, I'm asking for this. I'm asking for that. You know, Lord, you know, we, People just ask for all kinds of things. In the name of Jesus. We're asking this in the name of Jesus. But listen, I think the best way to illustrate this, you know, an ambassador, okay, if our president has an ambassador, okay, and he sends him to another country, he gives him certain authority. He might give him certain, uh, you know, negotiate, you know, like you can negotiate this much. You know, you can offer this much military help. You can offer this much financial aid. You know, he'll give them something and you can do that. You have my authority to do those things. But listen, when that ambassador goes there and he's doing whatever it is the president sent him to, he's acting on the will of the president and he's going in the name of the president, isn't he? And we need to understand God has asked us to do things in his name, but those things are according to his will, aren't they? That doesn't mean that we just get to go, you know, so if I'm the ambassador and I go there, it's like, you know what? I know the president sent me here, but you know what? I've got an agenda and I can just, you know, and I'm just going to, if I go and start promising them all kinds of things or whatever, 
that I have not been authorized to do that clearly I know is not the will of the president, I have no right to do that and say, you know, in the name of the president, you know, we're going to do this, this, and this. And that's what people do many times. Things that it's not the will of God, you know, in Jesus' name, you know, I'm asking for this and acting like they should get it. No, listen, you weren't authorized for that. We're trying to get the will of God done here. And there are certain things that clearly God wants done, that he wants, they are his will. He wants those to happen. And we ought to pray for those things and we ought to ask for them in Jesus' name. And I believe he'll give us those things. But unfortunately, uh, we many times, the things we're asking for, they're not things that are according to our will or according to his will, but according to our will. Things that he has not, you know, given us, uh, you know, I, I don't have the right to go, you know, Lord, my neighbor I have, I would love, you know, in your name, I'm asking you to slay them, you know. No, that's not, that's not what he asked us to do. You know, it's his will that they get saved, you know. And so, you know, Lord, in your name, help me to be a testimony. Give me an opportunity to witness. And I believe it will answer that request. But most of the time, that, those aren't the things we're praying for. So, you know, that's not a name and claim it. But look at verse 18. It says, um, Yet a little while, and the world seeth me no more, but ye see me, because I live, uh, and ye shall live also. Um, and then verse 20, at, at that day, ye shall know that I am in my father and ye in me and I in you. He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me and he that loveth me shall be loved my father and I will love him and will manifest myself to him. Um, in verse 18, when he says, I will not leave you comfortless, I will come unto you. Okay. Now notice he has said in this per, in this passage before he said, I'm going to leave. And I'm going to send the Comforter, which is, is the Holy Spirit. But then he said, I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. So is this here proving that Jesus is the Holy Spirit? Once again, the whole oneness thing? Obviously not. Once again, speaking spiritually here, but also this is an authority thing. Jesus is God. He is allowed to speak on behalf of God. The Holy Spirit is on, it acts on the will of Jesus Christ. And so in, in verses 16 through 18, Jesus calls the Holy Spirit He, and He calls it I. And I, do, I think it's the same thing as a president telling another country, I'm with you militarily. I'll be with you. I'll fight side by side with you. But is the president going to leave the Oval Office? No. What's he mean? I'm going to send the, my army. I'm going to send my military. I'm going to send my soldiers that act under my authority and I will be with you. And you know what? If there's a fight, I would rather it be the military by my side than the president himself you know, in, in that case. But you know what? It is because they're acting under his authority. And so Jesus did. Jesus left this earth, but he sent the Holy Spirit who is with us today. But yet we are waiting for Jesus to come back, aren't we? We're waiting for the son to return. But the Holy Spirit is here right now, and therefore He is here by the Holy Spirit. And so uh, we need—we need, it's important we understand these things. And so, if this passage is showing that Jesus is the Holy Spirit, then verse twelve proves that we are the Holy Spirit. Because in verse twelve, verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me, the works that I do, shall he do also, and greater works than these he shall do, because I go to my Father. Bible, he said, you're going to do great works. Well, why are we going to do those great works? Because the Holy Spirit's in us. That doesn't mean we are the Holy Spirit. It just means he's in us. And Jesus was in the Father. And so, once again, these are spiritual things that's being spoken of here. Not physical things. And people do. They try to take things way too literal and make spiritual things physical. And that's a mistake. So we are in Christ and in the Father, but we are not Christ or the Father. Verse 19 says, Yet a little while, and the world seeth me no more, but ye see me because I live, ye shall live also. At that day ye shall know that I am in the Father, and ye in me, and I in you. He that hath my commandments, and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me, and he that loveth me shall be loved my Father, and I will love him, and will manifest myself to him. So we see that you know we are in him, he is in us, he is in the Father. We see how we're all connected, right? It's spiritual. Okay? It's not physical. And that's how we can say that we are of Israel today, folks. Because Israel, it's not a spiritual thing. If you're in Christ, you're Abraham's seed. It's not a physical thing. Okay? That does not matter. 
And so, and he noticed what he says too, um, in verse 21, in the end, he that loveth me shall be loved of my father and I will love him and will manifest myself to him. Now, listen, we know God loves the whole world, but y'all understand when we love God, we get loved back. Okay. Not once again, not just the feeling of love. I'm talking about love and action. We get it back. Okay. Jesus clearly while he was on earth, Jesus, who is no respecter of persons, Jesus, who is perfect. Did he not love some people more than other people? Why? Otherwise, why did he call They called John the beloved disciple. Jesus, the one whom Jesus loved. Well, Jesus loved everybody. But yeah, but he loved John in a special way. Why do you think that is? Well, we saw in the chapter four, it was the one that laid on Jesus' breast. He was the one that was just close to him. I mean, they had such a closeness that, you know what? Jesus just gave it right back. Kind of like the Bible says, draw an eye to God and he shall draw an eye to you. You know, cleanse your hands, you sinners. You know, purify your hearts, ye double-minded. We all say we want to be loved of God, but you know what? We like our sin too. You know what that's called? That's called being double-minded. You know what? Clean yourself up, draw an eye to God, and he'll draw an eye to you. You'll get closer to him. Jesus clearly had a special connection with Lazarus, Mary, and Martha. Why do you think that was? Mary, probably more than Martha, because Mary was the one that would sit at his feet. Mary was the one that would wash his feet with her hair. Why did they do those things? Because why did Jesus love them so much? Because they loved him so much. And listen, the only thing stopping you from having an extremely close walk with Christ is you. And we do people sometimes, oh man, I'd love to have a walk with God like they do. You know, I would love that, you know, boy, God really seems to love them and they really seem to be blessed in a special way by God. I wish I had that. Well, you can have it if you wanted it. He's no respecter of person. The reasons you, you see that closeness is because you know, they, they were just giving it back. And he does. He shows love to all of us, but we often keep him at a distance. But we draw an eye to God. He's going to draw an eye to us. And we, we, need to, we ought to take advantage of that and get as close as we can. And so, um, you know, and it, you know, we, we're all the same way too. Listen, you know, there's people we like better than other people. You know, why is that? Because they like us. You, you can't help but like people who like you. Okay, it's, it, it's hard not to do. There's people out there that I have not met. There's people that leave comments all the time on the YouTube page that clearly like me. I've never met these people. I don't even know what they look like, some of them. But you know what? I like them already. <laughs> you know, I mean, just how can you help? But somebody says nice things about you. And, you know, oh, man, you're preaching so great. I'd love to meet you someday. And, man, I'd love to meet you too. We like to meet people who like us, you know? And so how can, how can I like somebody I haven't even met? I haven't even seen, I haven't even heard their voice. They like me. And so they're on my list and I uh, hope, hope to meet some of these people, hope to meet some of these people someday. Let's just admit it. We're all like that, that we do people who love us. We just, you, you love them back. And so we ought to, we ought to have that closeness with God. Uh, moving on verse 22. And on oh, those who love God, they'll have more revealed to them about God. But in verse 21, he says, I will love him and will manifest myself to him. Okay. You know, some of these people that I've gotten to know, you know, through, you know, I, they've emailed me. I've emailed them back. Some of them I've talked to on the phone. Some, some of them I've talked to face to face through, you know, the Google Hangouts and stuff. And I don't know, you just, Feel a connection with these people. You like them, you know. Why don't you like that with everybody? Well, some have reached out a little more than others, you know. And it's just, uh, it, it, it's just, it's a natural thing. And if you don't feel like you have a very close relationship with God, it's not because of Him. It's because of you. You know how? How do, you know, it seems like God really speaks to them and shows them things. Listen, draw an eye to God, and He'll draw an eye to you. And it's it's like that with people too. You know, it, good, you know, good luck. You know, if uh, hating somebody that likes you, you just, you can't do it. And why don't I have any friends? Cause you're mean to everybody, you know, <laughs> go be nice to people and you'll have friends. It's, it's that easy. It's, it's not hard. So verse 22 says, Judas saith unto him, not Iscariot, Lord, how is it that thou wilt manifest thyself unto us and not unto the world? Jesus answered and said unto him, if a man love me, he will keep my words and my father will love him. And we will come unto him and make our abode. 
with him. He that loveth me not keepeth not my sayings, and the world which he hear the word which ye hear is not mine, but the Father's which sent me. These things have I spoken unto you, being yet present with you, but the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. And so the thing we need to realize is that okay, we, we believe Father, Son, the Holy Ghost, they're all equally God, aren't they? Okay? And who is it? What part of God is here with us right now? It's the Holy Ghost. And listen, we can't see the Holy Ghost like they were able to see Jesus Christ, but the Holy Ghost is just as much God as Jesus was. And so would it make sense right now for us to get as close to the Holy Spirit as we possibly can? I mean, to just be filled with the Holy Spirit, to be obedient, to listen to the Holy Spirit, to let Him guide us and let Him direct us. He, the Holy Spirit is just as real as Jesus is real. And do you all realize, you know, to have a, you know, to be, have a closeness with the Holy Spirit, it takes more faith than it did for those disciples to have a closeness with Christ. And that, and so for us to have, I mean, if we could, if we can get as close as we can, I mean, following the leading of the Holy Spirit as close as we can, I believe we'll please God greater than he may even guys like John who laid on Jesus' breast. Because we're showing faith by doing that. We're going to see later, you know, in one of the future weeks with Thomas, you know, Jesus rebuked him because he had to see him to believe him. And Jesus said, blessed are they that have not seen and yet believe. When we have a closeness with God, when we can't see him, we are pleasing him in a way that the disciples couldn't have. And so we ought to take advantage of that. Being close to the Holy Spirit of God will give us the comfort and the power that we need. He's called him a comforter. He'll give him that. He will empower us. We need that power today. We need that comfort in this world we live in. And if we will draw an eye, if we will follow the leading of the Holy Spirit, if we will be filled with the Holy Spirit, we can have those things. We can have those blessings. And so verse 27, he says, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Ye have heard how I said unto you, I go away and come again unto you. If ye loved me, ye would rejoice because I said I go unto the Father, for my Father is, is greater than I. And now I have told you before it come to pass that when it come to pass, ye might believe. Hereafter I will not talk much with you, for the prince of this world cometh and hath nothing in me, but, as, but that the world may know that I love the Father, and as the Father gave me commandment, even so I do, arise, let us go hence. We see only, first of all, only Jesus Christ can give peace in tribulation and trials. He said, my peace I give with you. you know, and he, only he can give that. We can have peace in the midst of war. We can have peace... You know, yea, though we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, we'll fear no evil for thou art with me. He gives us that. And Jesus in this passage, he showed that he loved the Father. He said, if you love me, keep my commandments. He said, I'm going to show that I love the Father by obeying him. He went and was obedient unto death, even the death of the cross, proving that he loved the Father. And we ought to do the same thing. The way we prove that we love the Father is by being obedient to him. Jesus set that example. And when Jesus said that the, I love when he said, you know, the prince of this world cometh and hath nothing in me. I believe that he was saying this because it was about to look like Satan was winning for those next several day, few days. It was about to look like Satan had got the victory. But here's something to think about. This is just something to ponder. All right? I'm closing with this. Something to think about when you lay in bed tonight. All right. You know, when you know, it, did, it looked like Satan was winning that night. You had Judas who, or Satan who entered into the heart of Judas. Judas went and betrayed him. The disciples scattered. Jesus is taken by soldiers. He's beaten. He's crucified. And for three days, he's dead. It looks like Satan is getting the victory. But you know what? This is exactly what God wanted, wasn't it? This is what had to happen. Jesus had to die on the cross. And, you know, and when you see the way things play out in the gospel... It causes me to ask certain questions like, first off, how much does Satan know? Because if Satan would have been smart, wouldn't he have just not let Jesus get crucified? 
Wouldn't he have not entered into, you know, fine, you know what? I, I got to mess up Jesus' plan, so I'm not going to enter into Judas. Or I'm going to enter into Judas, and I'm not going to betray him. You know, so it's like, you know, what was Satan thinking? We see, you know, and also, you know, things to come that Satan's going to do. It's like, why doesn't Satan just read that and not do that? Okay, you know, it makes me think, you know, it makes it sometimes that Satan is taking orders from God. You know, just, uh, you know, because the devil, he, it seems like he does exactly what God wants him to do. You know, or, so, or is Satan taking orders from God, which, uh, you know, that doesn't seem right. Or has God just known from the foundation of the world exactly what Satan would do? You know, is God in heaven reacting to what Satan does and what man does? Or has God already done, every, you know, just set everything in motion that needed to be done? You know, it, it's something to think about it, you know, because, you know, you got the, you know, the dispensationalists that act like, you know, the Jews rejecting the Messiah and then, the, you know, going to the Gentiles was plan B. Like, oh, man, what happened? You know, I, I, I guess I'm going to go to the Gentiles now. But that's just stupid. All right. Because we see that it was prophesied that he was going to go to the Gentiles in the Old Testament. So, you know, that's just ridiculous. God's not up in heaven reacting and responding to what, you know, to, uh, you know, to what man does. He has always known what man would do. He has always known what the devil would do. And he was even able to give us a Bible and to give us his word in a way where he could tell us everything that was going to happen. And yet, for somehow, Satan's not able to look at it and mess the plan up. And we can't even look at it and mess the plan up. I mean, it's just, you know, either way you look at it, you have to be impressed with God. Amen. That's all there is to it. You have to be impressed that nothing messes up his plan. I personally think that he did. He set everything in motion. I don't think he's up in heaven reacting and responding to everything that's going on. I think the work's been done from the foundation of the world. And it's, he is in heaven just watching it play out exactly as he knew it always would. And the devil, he, you know, there's nothing he can do to change it. It's like one of these time travel movies. They're always going to go back and try to change things, but you know, it never works out. You know, fate always happens. And that's, I think that's how the devil feels. That's how come he inspires all these Hollywood people to make movies like that. It's like the life story of the devil. You know, <laughs> I just keep trying all these things, but God's will keeps on happening. Why? Because he is God and he's an amazing God. I don't, I don't totally know the answers to all that, but you do. You have to look at these things and just say, wow, we have an impressive, mighty God. And so with that, let's all go ahead and stand together.